You might have noticed from the example we covered during the last main video that we labeled our gears starting with a 2. Since the first driving gear is not moving on its own, but most probably due to it being located on a rotating shaft, we usually set aside the number 1 for that first element of rotation. From the relationships we derived then, we know that if we know the number of teeth of two mating gears, the diameters of two mating gears, or one of the diameters, the number of teeth of the other, and the diametral pitch or module, we can find the ratio between their rotating speeds. Even though the term gear trains technically refers to any gear system that has two or more gears, therefore making every gear system a gear train, we commonly use it to talk about a system where there are three or more gears on the same plane. Regardless of the number of gears, any system that is connected to transmit power from one end to the other will have elements that are driving and elements that are being driven. And notice that I'm using the word elements since you can even have pulleys for example, besides just gears. For a 5 gear train consisting of 3 gears in the same plane, 2, 3 and 4, and obviously the other 2 on another plane, we can find out the speed of gear 6 if we know the speed of gear 2, and of course the number of teeth or the diameters of the gears. From what we know, the speed of gear 3 would be n2 over n3 times the speed of gear 2, n4 would be n3 over n4 times the speed of gear 3, which we already have in terms of n2. We know that n4 and n5 rotate at the same speed since they're probably on the same shaft, and the speed of gear 6 would be n5 over n6 times the speed of gear 5, which we also have in terms of the speed of gear 4. This expression shows us several things. The first thing is that n3 appears both in the numerator and the denominator, and that's totally fine. Of course, this means that mathematically it'll cancel out, which means that physically it's not affecting the output speed of the system. These gears are called idler gears, and they are usually used just to change the direction of the rotation, or in other words, keep the direction of the rotation of the two gear ratios you actually want to use, in this case have gear 2 and 4 modify the speeds and torques, but have both of them rotating in the same direction. If we didn't have the idler gear, gear 3, gears 2 and 4 would have an opposite direction of rotation, instead of having them both rotate clockwise like in this example. The second thing is that the gears that I have in the numerator are those that are driving other gears. The gears that I have in the denominator are those that are being driven. The train value, E, is defined exactly as that fraction. A fraction with the number of teeth of driving gears on top and the number of teeth of the driven gears in the bottom. Now, you don't need to memorize which ones go on top and which ones go in the bottom, or even remember the name of the train value. If you're trying to find the speed of 2 in terms of the speed of 6, and suppose for a second that we didn't have any other gears besides those two, you know that from our first and very simple relationship, n2 is n6 times n6 over n2. This means that the number of teeth always goes together with the speed of the gear you are multiplying it by. If the other gears do exist, the expression would still be speed of 6 times n6, and by identifying that 6 is a gear that's being driven, you add all of the number of teeth of the driven gears next to n6. Then at the bottom, you put the rest of the gears, in this case the driving gears. Notice that the two expressions are correct, and that I'm not using a memorized expression for the train value. I'm only using the simple relationship we derived during the last main video. The third thing we can notice here is that if we evaluate the speed of gear 6 with a given speed of gear 2, the numerical result would have the same sign as gear 2. Mathematically that would happen because the number of teeth of every gear is a positive value. So if n2 is positive, n6 is positive, and if n2 is negative, n6 is negative. Which in this case means that gear 6 would be rotating clockwise, and that's not true. With a quick analysis of the rotation direction of each gear, we can see that if gear 2 is rotating clockwise, gear 6 would be rotating counterclockwise. For this reason, for any gear system, the best way to find the rotation direction is to do a separate analysis instead of remembering rules about the train value expression. In this case, since I know the direction of rotation of gear 6 is opposite to that of gear 2, I would just add a negative sign to the train value. Worth mentioning now is the rotation direction relationship between different elements. Mating spur gears will have opposite direction of rotation, as will mating helical gears. Notice that the top views show the rotation direction of the gears as a vector that represents the rotation on the surface closer to the viewer. 
For bevel gears, you would always see direction vectors either coming in or coming out of the intersection point, since teeth in contact would be moving in the same direction. For worm gears or helical gears that are crossed so that their axes are perpendicular to each other, the trick is to follow one helical tooth through its motion. If the visible face of the top gear is moving down, this yellow tooth will be moving down as well. After an instant, the tooth will have moved down a little, which means that the tooth from the bottom gear that was in contact with the tooth from the top gear will have moved left, and therefore the bottom gear would have moved counterclockwise. This analysis can be done for any configuration. If the gear on top is moving up, the tooth from the top gear would be moving up with it, and therefore the tooth from the bottom gear would be moving to the right. We'll talk more about helical and worm gears later, but for now, know that a slight clockwise rotation of the orientation of the teeth of a spur gear is called a right-hand helical gear, and a slight counterclockwise rotation of the orientation of the teeth is called a left-hand helical gear. Same goes for worm gears. And finally, since pulleys are often used in speed torque transmission systems, just know that connected rotating pulleys will have the same direction of rotation, which is pretty obvious if you follow any moving location on the belt, cable, or chain. Going back to the gear trains, when some gear axes are allowed to rotate about others, which physically means that the shafts that hold the gears are rotating about other gears, we call these trains planetary. Planetary trains always include a sun gear, an arm or a planet carrier, and one or more planet gears. The relative angular velocities of a gear with respect to the arm, which is the same to say the relative RPM, are given by the typical relative speed definition, which is the subtraction between the RPMs of the gear and the arm. For example, N23 is N2 minus N3. We could do the same for the speed of gear 5 relative to the motion of the arm. N53, which means the speed of 5 with respect to 3, the arm, is equal to N5 minus N3. And by dividing the equations, we see that N23 over N53, which is just N2 over N5, since their point of reference, in this case the arm 3, is the same, what would N2 over N5 be? For any gear train, taking into account what we learned today, it would be exactly the reciprocal of the train value E. In general, the train value for a planetary gear system will be the speed of the last gear, in this case gear 5, minus the speed of the arm, in this case element 3, over the speed of the first gear, minus the speed of the arm. Let's work on two simple examples today. We'll start with what we just talked about. In this planetary train, the sun gear is rotating clockwise at 100 RPM, and the ring gear, which is just a ring with teeth in the inner part, is rotating counterclockwise at 10 RPM. What is the speed and rotation direction of the arm and gear 4? From what we just learned, we know that the speed of the arm, the last gear, the first gear, and the train value are related. And we know that the train value is given by the number of teeth of the driving gears, in this case 2 and 4, since 2 is driving 4 and 4 is driving 5, divided by the number of teeth of the gears that are being driven, in this case 4 driven by 2 and 5 driven by 4. Additionally, we know that this train value needs to be negative, since the rotation of the gear 2 is in opposite direction of the rotation of gear 5. A brief clarification here, even if the given speed of 5 was clockwise, Gear 5 will always rotate counterclockwise with respect to gear 2. Since the yellow line of gear 2 is clockwise and the yellow line of gear 5 is counterclockwise and therefore opposite in direction, that negative sign needs to be there for the train value always. It might happen that because arm 3 is moving clockwise, despite 4 moving counterclockwise, ring 5 might also be moving clockwise, which is a simple dynamics problem. But again, 5 with respect to 2, following the yellow lines, will always be opposite in direction of 2. Substituting the given values and solving for N3, which is the speed of the arm, would give me an arm speed of 12 RPM in the clockwise direction. Knowing the speed of the arm, I can find the relative speed of gear 4 with respect to the arm and also the speed of gear 2 with respect to that same arm. The ratio between speeds 4 and 2 with respect to the arm is just the ratio between their speeds, which again, due to that basic relationship between number of teeth and speed, 
is a value I know. Solving for n4 from this equation and knowing once again that the direction of rotation of gears 2 and 4 are opposite and therefore a negative sign needs to be added, we find that the speed of gear 4 is 46.6 in the counterclockwise direction. Now let's work on another problem. The train shown is driving gear 9 knowing that the rotation of shaft A is 600 RPMs. What is the output speed and the direction of rotation of gear 9? Let's start by answering the direction of rotation question. If gear 2 is rotating as shown in the figure, we know that the front face of the gear 2 that we're seeing is moving up and therefore 3 is moving down. With it, since it's on the same shaft, 4 is moving down as well. 5 will be moving left since both teeth at the intersection are moving into the screen. The belt on the pulley 6 will be moving left and with it pulley 7. The worm gear 8 will be moving with the pulley, which means that the teeth on the right side of the figure we're seeing will be moving down, and so would the teeth of gear 9. To find the speed value of gear 9 as a function of the speed of gear 2, and by remembering what I said at the beginning of the video, that lowercase 2 will go together with capital N2, I identified that gear 2 is a driving gear, and so is 4, 6, and 8. The gears being driven would be 3, 5, 7, and 9. Since elements 6 and 7 are not really gears, I would not be able to use information about their number of teeth. However, since the ratio of number of teeth is the same as the ratio between the diameters, which is the first relationship we learned, I can rewrite the expression in terms of diameters for 6 and 7 to find that the speed of gear 9 is 3.75 RPMs, and that in the counterclockwise direction. If you want to check out other problems related to gear trains and planetary trains, make sure to check out the links in the description below. In the next video, we will start looking at the interaction forces between the different types of gears, including how to calculate their components and what each one of them does to the system. Thanks for watching.